Ruiz. Welcome back to the next part of this Truth and Rhythm episode. Be sure to subscribe to this channel. If you've already done so, please share it with friends. Also become a member by joining Truth and Rhythm on Patreon or consider donating at funkinstuff.net. Thank you so much for your interest and support. Enjoy. Hey, before we get started with today's show, I just want to draw your attention to new merchandise. Funkin' Stuff and Truth and Rhythm designs are in, and they look pretty darn cool. So show your support, help support the program, and show off some stylish merchandise and apparel. Only at the Funkin' Stuff store. Oh. It seemed like you were also getting more writing credits when this record came around. Uh, I would always be trying to trying to write and never really having a lot of confidence in what I was writing, but I'd bring stuff into the band and, oh, there was, you know, jealousy started coming in and, and egos to, and, uh, why is he always doing all the interviews? You got plenty of things to say and. See, I think that what happens with us, it happened with us. I'm sure it happens with other bands. You're a tight band. You're buddies. Something good happens for you and you start, life starts getting bigger and bigger. And each guy starts developing his own little forum of fan family. And they say things like, well, how, how come uh, Pete or, or Gil does all the interviews? You got a good thing to say, whatever. Hey, how come... How come he sings every song? You got a good voice. So people start bringing this kind of tension. I think it's tension. They bring it to the party, and now our little tight party is starting to fall apart. So um, I, I just don't know... Uh, why that happens, but it sure did happen. And you know what? I'm sorry. I went off in my head there. What was the original question? Get me back there. Well, you were in the in the neighborhood. I was just uh, observing that you had more writing credits on this oh. record, it seemed, than on previous. Okay, so I'm really a peaceful person. I, I, liked, I like everybody to be peaceful, physically, emotionally, everything. And the tension that came, I thought to myself, this this is the stuff that breaks up bands. And I always knew that from the Sunliner days that there was none of that tension. There was real love and support and just caring and it wasn't an ego party or nothing. But when we got going and we had a couple different people in the band, you know, but I felt that this is, will destroy the band. So what I did was I made a suggestion. I said, I'll tell you what. Every song I write, I'm going to put all your names on it. I'm going to throw it into the pile. You want to throw yours into the pile? And a couple of them said, yeah, well, I think we could do that, yeah. And there was, there was one person that, that threw his thing in the pile, but not quite all the way in, you know what I mean? So that's why my name, and then there's me, and there's other five other names, Olson, Monette, Bridges, Guzman. Eddie Guzman never wrote a song, but he's a writer on so many songs. It was only because we were trying to keep the peace. Trying to make it democratic. Yep, and you look back on it now and go, I was a fool. Uh -huh. <laughs> but I wasn't a fool. That was life. That was It was okay, man. There are no sour grapes here. 
I really, I want to mention, I really like the road on that record too. That's a the hot road. One. The Tom Beard wrote that. Yeah. Dun, 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 dun. Yeah. Speak, when speaking you want of to find your own road and you need an open door. I can remember all the lyrics to every song I ever sang. It's kind of strange, isn't it? But I can't remember my phone number sometimes. No, I can't. I'm just kidding. <laughs> okay. Um, so when you, you left to go off with Hub, um, I understand, was it uh, Tom's passing that kind of signified the end of that? And is that why you ended up going back to Rare Earth? Well, I guess, you know, that's a fair assumption, really. Uh, when Rare, when I broke up with Rare Earth in 74, 75, they sued me. And I had like three years of being sued for millions based on I'm taking the name Rare Earth, which I wasn't, and I'm taking the... Uh, the uh, 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 money, uh, I forget what it's called right now. It's uh, royalties. Maybe. No, it's it's money put aside. Uh, uh, anyways, it's put aside and you you pay the band the money later and your taxes are much better. It's something, what is it called? Uh, what? Uh, anyways, it doesn't matter. But I wasn't taking it. And I wasn't taking the name Rare Earth either. And so we had this trial in New York and uh, profit sharing is what I'm talking about, profit sharing money. So when I quit the band, I knew the trouble was going to come. So I flew out with my attorney to L.A. and I went to John Miller, the president of the Bank of California. I said, John, it's going to be a lawsuit. Please put the profit sharing in a drawer and don't let anybody take it. The courts will decide. Okay, he did that. Found out later, about 45 minutes later, a couple guys from the band were in there trying to cash out the profit share. And it was like 150 grand in there. And the name, I didn't want the name. So anyways, the court came, they found me not guilty. They gave me a settlement. I gave it to the attorneys. You know how that goes. And uh, so here I am. Now I go, Mike Urso, the you in, in Hub, Mike Urso was a replacement. He replaced John. He was with us for years. Mike's a great guy. He quit because I quit. And I didn't want him to quit because I quit. You know, I didn't want a pal. You know what I mean? Come on, I'll take you along with me. I didn't want that. I wanted to be alone. So anyway, Mike and I, I talked to Mike and I called Tom Beard. I said, Tom, would you ever like to get together? And so then I called Al and my attorney and we called Barney Ellis and Barney gave us an opportunity to do two albums for Hub. So I got a grand piano in my house and Tom came into my house every day at 9 a.m. And we wrote songs till five and five, sometimes later. And we were songwriters for 20th century. It was, it was really good. We had a paycheck every week. And we wrote, 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 wrote. And Tom, unfortunately, had bought a tornado catamaran little sailboat where the two pontoons, you've seen them. And he took it out. He was taking lessons, but one day he took the boat out and went out on the ocean by himself, figuring that he knew enough about it. Anyways, he died in a boating accident. The, the, the thing swung and hit him. They found him three or four days later, life jacket and everything, but he had a bump on his head and that was it. Tom was dead. Well, it happened when we were, the next two days, we were supposed to do the lead vocals on the second Hub album. So I had one album done. The second album, I go in there and I got Mike Urso, no Tom. And I'm standing there going, well, man, I got to sing these songs. Because see, Tom was, Tom was my sounding board. How was that? Oh, a little bit more of this? Okay. Oh, a little over the top on that? Okay, I'll back it off. Boom, 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 boom. That's how I, you know, the producer. And uh, he wasn't there. So I did the best I could and the albums were done. And yeah, after the albums were done, Barney agreed to do another album on us. And I said, Barney, I think I can get the band back together. Okay. So I had Mike and I had, I couldn't get Mark and Ray. See, Mark and Ray were the two guys that came in after Rodney and Kenny Falsick, the original guys. And when they came in the band over the years of doing shows, 
they kind of resented having to do songs every night that they didn't play on. And of course, we swept that under the rug and went, all right, it's okay, man, don't worry about it. Just, we just do the songs. We'll have more songs with you guys in there. Well, here comes a chance to do this album several years later, and they're not going to come. So Barney gave me, gave Mike and I, a little bonus check to come back. When Gil came back, he gave Gil the same bonus check because Gil and I were the two originals. Mike was a hired guy. So now Ray and Gil, they, you know, and Barney says, I don't care about Ray and Gil. I don't care. About, I mean, Ray and Mark. He said, I don't care about Ray and Mark. I'm not giving them any money. If they want to come back and do the album, fine. Well, they were going to stand off against Barney Ellis. Big mistake. So in the next studio was a guy named Dan Ferguson and Ken, uh, I can't remember his last name, keyboard player. They were doing a session. So I walked in there, and I said, hey, you guys taking a break pretty soon? Yeah, we're almost done here, 10 minutes. So I come back in 10 minutes. I said, hey, we're in the other studio with James Carmichael, the guy that produced, you know, uh, Lionel Richie. Commodores, yeah. Yeah. James is a nice guy. So anyways, I said, you guys want to be on a record? Come on in. Yeah, okay. So they came over, and now that was that Rare Earth Orange album. You may have seen the cover. And on the back is I'm sitting there and there's two guys you don't recognize. And the James Carmichael did the album. So we did that album. That was done. And after that was done, there was no, there was nothing there really, you know, on that album. And so then a lot of time went by and uh, we managed to do <sighs> Dino Fakaris from the Celebrate Days. He emerges later, big star with his Grammys. He comes and we bump into him, and I got a song called King of the Mountain that I write, and I'm showing it to the band. It's pretty strong, kind of a groove, really nutsy groove. And I show it to Dino, and Dino goes, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So, okay, now we're going to get together. Well, Dino brings in like eight songs, and I have King of the Mountain. And he goes off to RCA. Comes back a couple of days later. He says, man, I got a record deal for us. Do the album. Great. So we go, we make studio, and who knows who took what money out of that budget, but we got a guy in the studio, give us a deal, a fixed, a fixed amount to do the album. So there was money left over. So a few other people enjoyed that, I guess. Anyways, we did this album out there. The Eight of Dino songs and King of the Mountain which Dino redid King of the Mountain a little bit, not to my liking, but he just felt that Bob, he's the producer. And Dino looked up at me and he came up and he goes, you know something, man? He says, you're a drummer. He says, and you're almost a singer. And I thought, you know, Dino, don't leave the windows in your Cadillac down because I'm going to fill your car with cement. I'm going to have a truck come up. I, mean, I got really pissed and hurt. Anyways, that record come out, and they said, no, we're not going to release this record. And I went to RCA to the guy in charge. He goes, what the hell happened? I says, what do you mean what happened? We did this album. He says, no, no, no. He says, I gave you a deal because of the King of the Mountain song. He says, you didn't do it that way. And he says, these other songs, the other eight or nine songs, just pfft. We don't care about those. We're not going to promote this album. I just went, oh, that was that. It was over. It wasn't too long, a few years after that, that I joined up with Panera, Jerry Corbett. We went out on the road for 17 years and just played. Wow. Do you, do you think there's any chance that those hub records may, um, you know, be available again at some point? Well, I don't know because it's, I've got to figure out who really owns them. It's a question of whether whether uh, uh, Capital owns them or Motown owns them. Because when, when, when we did those couple albums, Barney was going to retire again from Motown. So he called Al Corey at Capital, and Al brought us over there. And now we're, we released the albums Capital. And then shortly after that, Al Corey left Capital. 
<laughs> so we were like, we were on Fairfax Boulevard, like going, where do we go? Anyways, life goes on and I'm here right now. Talking so I've only you. been able to hear, there's only one or two songs I could find on the internet and I don't have those records and they sound pretty good. So it piqued my curiosity. I have, I have, uh, I have all those songs on, on my deal. And, uh, yeah, Dave Siebert, my producer, I told you, extraordinaire. We went in one day and did four tracks at his old studio. And one was called, I gave you all the love. I got. It's called All the Love. And then another track is called Easy Street. And then we did King of the Mountain, but we didn't call it King of the Mountain, did we? Uh, yeah, we did. We called it King of the Mountain. And we went back. So And I have four songs, and Dave called it Blue-Eyed Soul. We never put it out as a record, but now we're thinking about it. Because after all these years, there's a lot of people who are talking about all this past, rare earth and stuff like that. And I've got a lot of songs that, songs that I did with Dave that I really believe in, you know, and they never really came out on record. I still got them. And I'm thinking, you know, why not put them out there? Why not? Why not? Yeah. So we're, we're talking about it and how we're going to do it. We went and did a show at Everett, Washington at the Everett Theater. It's a famous, well-known theater from years back. And the guy that runs the thing is just a, a beautiful guy. And he had us come in. And we did. he had a five-camera shoot and a 40-track recorder. And he shot the show for two hours. And Dave, when we got, when I got back, I, I gave him the video and the audio. And Dave went off for a couple of weeks. He called me up. He goes, man, this video, this is really – and he mixed it all. And so now Dave has completed two DVDs. It's two hours long of, of us at the, at the Everett Theater. And the songs, all the songs are on there and everything. So Dave wants to put that out. I said, yeah, put that out. Put everything out. Put my old car out there. Maybe somebody wants that. You know? <laughs> so, you know, I'm, I just, I don't know. You know, I did, I'm just I'm trying to have a really good time living. Sure. I like to have a good time, man. And fortunately, I, you know, I, I f feel pretty honored because a lot of people haven't ever been able to do some of the stuff that I've done. I was real fortunate. Did, did you ever get to uh, meet or spend much time with Stevie Wonder? Oh, yeah, yeah. Stevie. <laughs> I love Stevie, man. I love well, he, He's a bit of a drummer himself, you know? Oh, absolutely. That's that drum set we couldn't move in a studio. So, Steve, we get the word. When, this is, okay, I forgot about this. This is after we did the Carmichael thing and everything else. Somebody said, hey, man, you guys ought to be working with Stevie. I said, whoa, that'd be great, man. So here it comes about. We go to the studio, and we're, we got our stuff. We're setting up. We always go an hour early and set up our stuff. And here comes Stevie with another. And he comes out, to, out there in the studio, and he's talking about this song called Let Me Love You. And he's going, let me love you. Let me love you. And I went, oh, that's pretty cool, Stevie, you know. So we worked a little bit on the track. He kind of showed us kind of how it goes. He goes in the control room, and we're, we're doing the track, and he finally says, that's it. We can work with that. Oh, okay, great. You know, and he's up there doing this thing. But you know what? He's on the phone all the time. I mean, he's just – it's before cell phones. He's just on the phone. So I'm singing the lead. I'm trying to sing the lead. And I sing a, a line – and the tape stops, and I don't hear anything. So I go, uh, well, how was that? And I hear, cool, man. Okay. <laughs> Bob, you know, the engineer, I said, roll the tape, punch me in again, you know. So I punch in the same spot again. So Stevie's still doing this. So it's 45 minutes of this, so Stevie, you know, and I'm singing, and I'm not getting any feedback at all. What's happening? Do I sound like a frog? What's going on? So finally, I said, Stevie, 
Can you do me a favor? Can you hang up the phone? I guess it's the wrong thing to say. He didn't say anything. He didn't get really offended. But when the session was over that day, it was over, period. We weren't going back in with Stevie anymore. And you know what? Sorry. I love the guy. I always will. He's greatest. And we just could not work together. What year about would you say that was? She's I can't even remember. 80s. 80s. But I'll tell you a little story. About three or four years later, I'm in Motown offices. And way over there is a couple of doors of little offices. The door opens up and Stevie comes out of that door. Now, he's about at least 50, 60 feet away from me. And I went, Stevie. And he says, Pete, how you doing, man? And I thought, oh, my God, what kind of ears does this guy have? He remembers my voice from five years ago just by me saying, Stevie. And I thought, man, oh, man, what a guy. So I love Stevie. I think he's phenomenal. And I'll tell you who I really think was phenomenal is Prince. That guy, man, when he puts on a song, I know he's shucking and jiving and he's cool and all this, but man, he is good. And the music, the players are great too. And everything is so thought out, the clothes, everything. Of course, he's got all the money to do all that crazy stuff. But man, I hear some of these Prince songs on in YouTube and I just can't believe how phenomenal the guy is. But back to Stevie, just being a good guy. And, and I heard him play, you know, and, I have a, a friend who's an engineer for Stevie. He says it's, he's the toughest guy in the world to record. He said, because he'll be going, my sherry but very superstitious. And they don't know what he's doing, but he's bouncing around mentally. And he's writing new songs within the song that he's trying to record or write. So how do you understand a mind like that? I don't. I don't know. <laughs> But anyways, he's just a genius. He's one of them. He's like a Ray Charles genius. Yeah, one of my favorite. Both those guys, Prince and Stevie, love, love, love. Oh, yeah, incredible. Just incredible. Um, who, who, who were some of the drummers that inspired you? Uh, there's many. Um, I used to think, I used to say that I was a a drummer who sang. Now I like to think of it as a singer who plays the drums. And when I see other drummers, some of them are just phenomenal. I, uh, I, I don't hold myself up in the same class as them. I'm a real simple drummer. I like the beat. I like to feel that momentum of the beat. I'm not the fancy Dan guy. I don't twirl my sticks. I don't hit everything I got just because it's a chance where I can. I'm surprising myself because one of the songs I'm doing right now, it's called, uh, well, it's called Someday. And I think that in the whole song, I'm playing boom, dicku, boo, do, bakku, daku, boo, goo, daku, boo, daku, boo, goo, da, boom. And somewhere I go, Boom, beep, boom, boom, da, do, 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 da, do. And that's all I do. But Dita. My fills are real. My fills, how that happened is when I was in the Sunliners, young, 16, the leader of the Sunliners was a guy named Fred Saxon. He's dead now. Love Fred. He was a true friend. His brothers were horse jockeys. Gives you an idea how big Fred was. But Fred was a sax player and the leader of the band. And he would turn to me and go, you're too busy, man. You're playing too busy. Too much stuff. Because I was all over the place. I'm 16. Hey, I got that town time. I want to hit it, you know. And so he would do that. And I'd be a little shy in front of the rest of the guys. So I'd back off on my busyness. Then when I started singing, I realized when I was going, I found my fill. Dun, 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 dun. Straight beat was nice, man. Easy to sing that way. 
So I started to be the drummer that just kind of plays straight. And over the years, people have told me that they say, you're, you're, when you play your groove, they really love my groove. And I go, really? They go, oh, man, I've learned so much from you on the groove stuff. And I'm going, learn from me? I barely hit my tom-toms. You know, and then there's these other guys who are well noted as being the all-time drummers. And I think they are. They're fantastic. But I don't try to get on the same, I don't try to get on the same elevator with those guys, man. I, I, I'm just a simple guy that way. So I think I'm pretty good at drums. And I know, I know when I love the beat and love the attitude, I'm always trying for it. And I get it, but it's just not a fancy Dan thing, you know. Yeah. Well, you know the pocket, and that's the most important the thing. That's it, know? the pocket. I know. I, I talk to people, and I say, well, he's really in the pocket. And they go, what does that mean? Well, you know, it means he's down in the pocket. He's grooving. He's got a hold of it, you know. And uh, it's just great, you know. It's just you know, um, there's amazing footage of you on YouTube uh, at Cal Jam. Uh, yeah. in 74 and what a crazy wild scene that was at that stadium yeah. um, was w I'm assuming that was kind of a memorable experience can you share with us one or two of your most unforgettable live experiences well Cal Jam was definitely one of them uh, we were the first band on in the morning and uh, the crowd was so big that we couldn't get to the stage so they helicoptered us from the hotel over the people, they swooped around over the people, holy cow, and set us be back behind the stage. And we were going to open the show. You want to talk about nervous? And I listened to the songs, Big Brother and Get Ready, and it's like they're three times faster than they should be. Like Big Brother is boom, 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 boom. And we were at boom, 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 boom. I mean, you because know, you know how that feels as a player. You get so amped up, and then you hear it back, and you go, oh, my God, listen how fast it was. You know, anyways, that happened. Uh, uh, Atlanta Pop Festival, 300,000 people down in Macon, Georgia. We're doing a show. It's d just about dusk. We finish our little thing, which was really strange because we were backstage before we went on, and I, I had some lemonade. And about 15 minutes before we were going to go on stage, and it was going to be the first night we ever played Losing You to an audience, the 300,000. So we're a little nervous about that. Well, I have this limiting about 15 minutes before I'm going on stage. I'm sitting in a chair, and I look up at this light up there, this round light. And I said, man, that light is oval. And I looked over here at something that I knew the shape of, and the shape had changed. And I went, oh, no, what, what's going on here? I started getting nervous. And so, okay, 10 minutes. And I'm going, oh, geez. So we walked up on stage. And I sat down at the drums. And I have a couple pictures of that, too. My hands are folded in my lap. And I'm looking at the drums. And I'm saying to myself, what are these things? What are you supposed to do with this? And I'm looking over, and the guys are putting on the guitars and the bass, and boop, 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 you know, little sounds, hearing sounds. And I go, oh, I'm so paranoid, so paranoid. And I'm convinced that everyone knows that I'm high. But the funny part about it is, the next time I really knew where I was, we were three songs into the show. And none of the other band members looked at me like anything was wrong. But to me, I had no memory of playing those three songs. I don't know how I did it. Then I had a phenomenon happen that I'll never want to happen again. I'm sitting at the drums, and I'm looking at 300,000 people, and all of a sudden, for a moment, all 300 people became one eyeball that was as big as like a huge spaceship, and the one eyeball is looking at me. That's paranoia, buddy. That's paranoia. <laughs> and and just as fast as it came, boom, it was gone. We came off the stage, and eventually I came down, and I never wanted that to happen again. So that was a memorable moment. That's really what they call hard lemonade. 
Yep. And then we played five nights, Madison Square Gardens, opening for Sly and the Family Stone. Oh, wow. And I always wanted to meet Sly. Well, back in Detroit when the 60s, we played a club up in Lansing, Michigan, called Grandmothers. And it catered to the Michigan State people, college students. And there was a new band nobody had heard of. He was just coming to Grandmothers to play for a night. It was called Sly and the Family Stone. And when I heard them, I went, uh-oh. It's a pretty cool band. Years later, we're playing Five Nights at the Madison Square Gardens. We go up there the first day, and I mean the place is packed. There's 20-something thousand people, and they're dressed to the hilt. And there's black people, white people, green people. There's all kinds of people. They're dressed to the hilt, and it's in the air, man. Sly. And we like to think, and rare earth. Anyways, we go out there, and we, we play our show. And the people were very nice. They, they liked it a lot. Now it's about a half hour break in between and Sly's going to come out on stage and he comes out on stage and he had this song called Thank You for Letting Me Be Myself and that's like okay and I'm waiting for that to start because I know these 25,000 people are going to rock this stadium so he comes out and he goes ding and he goes, hey. And I'm like, oh, my God, what is he doing? Well, he was pretty high. And he says, hey, wait a minute, wait a minute. Have you ever heard this? Hot fun in the summertime. And I'm standing right down the stage. I'm looking at this. I'm going. This guy's making a mistake. I'll never make a mistake like that in my life. I'll never treat the stage with that much dishonor. Mm. So he he quieted down, and all of a sudden, between songs, you hear rare earth, rare earth, rare earth. And wow. there's 20,000 people yelling rare earth, and here's Sly. Well, we didn't get to play again, but I mean, I walked away there going, okay, man, yeah. It's on, you know? <laughs> so that was memorable. There were several other memorable uh, times, uh, uh, other memorable times. Uh, RFK Stadium. Stage was 30 feet high, huge stage. And the people were all up in the stadium. And they said, you can't come down on the grass because you'll ruin the sod and the football game is Sunday, blah, 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 blah. Well, as soon as the band started, they came down. And not only that, but that 30-foot-tall stage started rocking like this. Uh, 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 I'm going, this is where we're going to die? We got off that stage. I mean, that was monumental. And there were, you know, Scott, there were so many things, man. Oh, yeah, South America. I mean, you know, whatever. Who who uh, might be, aside from Sly and the Family Stone, um, an act that just kind of blew you away? So many. God, how do I? Um, well, we we didn't have the opportunity to just sit and enjoy headlining acts when we were doing shows. First of all, those dressing rooms over there belong to them. These belong here, and you're in that one. So we'd come, we'd go on stage. The big act hasn't even, they're not showing their face yet. And we come off stage, we're in our dressing room, drying off, changing clothes, because we're going to get out of there, right? Now the big act's on stage. And you hear the screaming and everything, but I mean, the Eagles, uh, oh my goodness gracious. The Eagles were the first concert I ever attended back in 71. The Eagles? Yeah, with my sister. I used to know Don Henley in L.A. My uh, my uh, f friend's son used to work uh, at his little ranch there. But, you know, I, I don't know what to tell you on that because I only the, – the only acts that I wanted to listen to were acts that I was impressed with and I thought I can learn from these people, you know. Like Dr. Hook and the Medicine Man, we did shows with him. I never watched him. I just wasn't into that. But I wanted to watch Sly, 
and he didn't he just never played uh uh, Atlanta Pop Festival. I'm through with my show. I'm drying off with a towel and I'm backstage and up here, here comes a limo, pulls up right next to me, right next to me. And the back door opens and a foot comes out. It's got a boot on, like a snake boot. Boot goes on the ground. The other boot comes out. This guy stands up and he goes, hey man, how you doing? I said, hey, Jimi Hendrix, how you doing, man? Kind of an impressive moment. Yeah. I thought. Yeah. Buddy Miles taught me a lot. You remember him? Mm-hmm. Uh, changes. Drum. Yeah. Did a couple Them shows. changes. With, yeah. Did a show with Buddy. And they set up his drums. And I went and looked at his drums. And all the drum heads were beat to a pulp. I thought, how can he play these things? You know. Dan, 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 dick, dan, 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 dan. You know, he come out doing that. And then afterwards, we're in the, in the hotel room and, and uh, talking to him. And he says, come on up to my room. So we go up to his room, and we're talking. And he reaches under his bed, pulls out a bottle of pills. And he opens up and takes one of these things, pops it in his mouth. I says, what are those? So he told me what it was. I'm not going to talk about it now. I says, oh, I heard about those. He says, you want one? I said, yeah, okay. So I took one. I trusted Buddy, you know. <laughs> Well, five minutes later, he goes, Peter, he says, uh, you should probably go to your room. He says, because in about 15 minutes, you're going to go to sleep. And I went, you're kidding. So I went to my room. Sure enough, went to sleep. I woke up the next morning. I never felt so refreshed in my life. I don't know what that thing was. And that's the way those things are. The problem is, is we do it again and again and again. And then they don't act that way anymore. Yeah. And the drugs get really weird. I know we had our drug days too. You know who I saw on, on July 4th uh, is Grand Funk Railroad, who oh. I never actually even ever saw before. Mark Farner wasn't with him, was he? No, just the original uh, drummer. Right, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Um, and the guitar player from uh, Kiss. Yeah, I know Mark's a good friend. We we talk from time to time. We actually do a couple shows together. I just got a call to do another one with him. Uh in October. So I don't know. We'll see. We'll see. I'm trying to get out there and gig because I love playing, man. I just love to play. And I mean, if I knew for a minute that I have, have played my last show, eh, man, I don't know how I'd be affected by that. So I, and I talked to Mark Farner. We, we talked about this and wondered why we kept going and how, how it is that we kept going. He says, you know, he says, thing is is we believe that we have still got another hit in us and he said if we stop believing that he says we might as well just quit and i agree with him that's that's why we keep going i believe that there's something in there that's going to click with the world well, maybe that'll never happen you know but at least i believe it and it kind of keeps me going you still have that creative spark you know it's a beautiful thing Kind of keeps me a couple steps ahead of the Reaper. Yeah, like in your song. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm going to pull a, a reference out here that you probably haven't been asked before, at least for, for now a long time. And that was, um, it, I noticed that you had apparently, uh, at least you have a credit on Shaka Khan's sister album from 1979, Taka Boom. Is that something you recall doing? Oh, yeah, Taka Boom. She... Uh... John Ryan was doing a production on us, and he got Taka to sing something. Now, I don't know if I was on Taka's... I don't even know. I remember Taka. It was, love, sweet love. I remember the song. I'd have to look it up, but it is. Uh, yeah, it is on, on an album that John Ryan produced. What's this? And she could sing, man, I'll tell you. I remember it. No, I'm going to have to hear it after I get off with you because... I remember I liked it. Her and I did it. You got my love, my love. Something like that, right? Yeah. 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 And your your uh, your name's on there, so you should uh, take a look at that. Um, oh, good. I will. Thank you. Yeah. And then you had the commonality of she worked uh, with uh, Undisputed Truth, who was, you know, a Norman Winfield yep. act. And so there's yep. common threads. Oh, yeah. So in the meantime, I'm doing these – I'm. I'm, I'm, I kind of thought, well, that's it. You know, that's it. And then 
the people out there, like as of yourself and other people who are interested in all this stuff, there's kind of like a little new life that's surging around out there for me. There's, there's a lot more interest lately. I think that has to do with a lot of reasons. One is I'm very much older and people of my demographics are all north of at least 55, 60. And that's okay. I know that they don't buy records and they don't go to shows, but you know what? They just might buy a DVD. They might. And I'd like them to do that because uh, in my family, there is an illness and it's very scary. And uh, I'm, I'm not looking for, you know, tears or anything, but it affects my life like this. I will give anything I have to make that, help that person survive. I don't want to have to do that because I have some life left that I'm going to live and I'm going to pay my bills and stuff like that. I'm not after limousines and jet planes and caviar and silk suits and pounds of cocaine. I'm not after any of that stuff. I had all that stuff. Now, all that matters to me now is that the audience still enjoys what I do. I still am able to love and my family and my friends, and I just kind of want to be healthy, and I want to see my friends and my family and other people enjoying life and laughing with a lot of humor. I know it's really tough these days, but you know what? That's why I don't turn on Fox and CNN and all that stuff. Not because I don't care about our world. I do. It's just that I can't listen to all them doing that anymore because that's I care about my life, my family, my kids, my friends, my my stuff. So I would really like to know that the music thing, I survived my whole life from the music thing. And here I am faced with this problem, and I don't want to say, hey, but if I have to, I will swallow my pride, and I will go out to everybody I know and say, hey, let can you help this kid of mine? I'm helping. I'll give everything I got. I don't want anything, but I want to be able to not be wind up in a home on some farm and you know what I mean? Somewhere where life doesn't matter about me anymore. So I, I kind of got this little problem going on and I don't really want to uh, say it because I don't, you know, I don't want it to seem like, Oh, well, He's just after this or after that. I'm not. I'm. I'm. I'm scared. I. I. I want to keep my uh, family together, and uh, it's uh, a little nerve wracking. So I want to go out and do shows. I want to earn money. I want to earn my keep. I want to earn this, and I want to be able to help my kids and do blah 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 blah. blah. And if I have to, I'll sell the house. I'll sell it all. I'd do anything for my kids. You would too. That's the way sure. we are, and that's the way yep. we should be. So anyways, uh, who knows? Peter, um, besides your autobiography, I mean, you've done these podcasts that document, you know, your history so well also. I mean, I want people to know that those are also available uh, through your website. I'm not sure where else, but uh, that's pretty uh, incredible that you put those together too. Well, the, I did that. Uh, I made each one of them like 15 to 20 minutes long, no longer, because I thought, gets a little boring as maybe I have been on your show here <laughs> a little boring because I go on and on man you get me started and I could just go baby and uh, I just sat there and turned the mic on and just started up and, and I would try to leave the thing like and then Tom came to the studio Doo -doo -doo. hey this is Peter Rivera thanks a lot for listening Cliff Come on back tomorrow you know anyways <laughs> I've got 46 of them and right now I'm on 20 or 20, 21, I think. So I've got another 20 no one's heard. And then I also I got to the point where I was, didn't want to be redundant. I didn't, I wanted to tell, you know, refreshing stories or, 
and uh, but I've been doing some interviews lately. And man, I tell you, I, you guys are, uh, you know, it's like you're poking me, and information's popping. <laughs> oh shit, I forgot about that myself. You know, which is great fun because it's hard to. Uh, how do you do that for sixty years? You know, I mean, I started playing when I was ten. I'm seventy seven now. Mm. Sixty seven years. I've just been doing whatever. You know. Anyway, what what does uh, funk music mean to you? And can you describe perhaps the intersection of rock and funk? I think funk for me, and I don't know what everyone else's description of funk is, but when I hear something, I go, man, that's really funky. It kind of moves me. It moves my body parts. It, uh, I can feel it tension in my, well, like in my groin, like, yeah, you know, tightening up your buttocks. Go, oh, man, that's, that's, he really hits a great note there. So it's, it's a physical feeling funk. Pop music is a mental feeling to me. I can sit there and listen to a really great song, and there are some phenomenal songs out there that are pop music. But I don't feel pop music in my body. I feel it in my brain and my heart. You know, I mean, just the other night I watched uh, The Mule. Don't let the old man in. Now, I just went, wow, listen to that. It was so tender and he's so good with that song. But then I listened to Prince going, eh, I'm a and I'm here, <laughs> my body's starting to move, see? So that's funk to me. So my body moves. When my head, my heart moves, that's pop. That's my only description. My right, funk is more visceral. Is that the word visceral? Yeah. You know, it's got a physicality to it that just yeah. gets in you. When I was playing, uh, we were playing in Washington, D.C. at Constitution Hall. It was way back in the beginning days, and we were setting up the stuff, sound checking, right before we are going to play. This people were already in the place. We were the only white people there. And I was going to test my bass drum, and I went boom, 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 boom. And by the time I hit it the fifth or sixth time, I heard somebody go, yeah, baby. And they were all jumping off, off of the diving board, into the pool. Here we go. Let's go. And I went, man, I'm just sound checking my bass drum. And I thought, holy cow, this is going to be fun tonight. And I'm telling you what, it was. It was great fun. And I realized that, you know, I'm playing for a predominantly black audience and they're partying, they're loose, they're not afraid to be screaming or uh-huh and yelling and waving their hand they're not afraid to do that because that, that, they feel that then i've played at the naval academy in colorado springs and all the beautiful girls are on the arm of their servicemen who are in uniform and they're all sitting i'm playing the same song to them that i played in and they're enjoying it i'm not making fun of that they're enjoying it but it took a while before they, you know, took their hat off. And, and a little later on, we did a ballad, and a few of them stood up to dance a little bit. And I thought, big difference here. Now, I'm not putting down either one of them. Certainly not the Naval Academy, because, come on, they have some kind of a, of a restrictions of, of behavior. I mean, they're under a watchful eye, I'm sure. And the people over there in Washington are just like, hey, screw it, man. Let's go for it. Let's have a party. So I, I kind of learned that different thing. Like when we, we, when we heard we were going down to Louisiana to play this show, I went, yeah. And we got there and they said, whatever you do, you're on stage. You got to call them Cajun MF. Cajun, you Cajun MF. So I did it. I said it on the mic. And when I said it, they went nuts. They loved that about themselves, you know. So you pick up these things, you know, pick up those things like that. Yeah. 
Cajun. Um, then, yeah, go ahead. Oh, no, were you going to add something? No, no, no. Yeah. I was going to say. I'm around, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, did you ever get to meet Aretha? Never. You know, she's from Detroit, too. Yeah. Never met her. I mean, wow, Aretha Franklin, man, I'm telling you, that woman could sing. Of course, you know, millions of people have said that, but there was just something about the way she did it, and and uh, it's it was effortless. That's what makes it nice when it's effortless. So what I'm trying to do with my songs, I sing them in a way where it doesn't sound like I'm really trying to, you know. But anyways, it doesn't matter. And then Ray Charles, I mean, you know. Drown in my own tears. You know what I said? What I said? You know, Ray, holy cow, man. <laughs> and then, uh, yeah, Etta James. Trust in me, boy, and I'll be strong. Come on, Daddy. We can get along. Oh. Why don't you, you trust in me? Boy. Anyway, yeah. sorry I sing that so because I'm not doing it justice. But oh, you're, doing, you're doing pretty good. And, uh, you know, I can't sing at all. Uh, one of my great uh, um, regrets of life is I can't sing. But. Well, you know, I don't know. So, Peter, how can everybody watching, listening, keep up with your, your single releases and, you know, find all the stuff you're doing and keep up with you? We're releasing these singles on Spotify. Okay. Peter Rivera, Spotify. I'm putting a lot of these releases and things on my Facebook page, Peter Rivera Music. There's a Peter Rivera page, Facebook, Horlbeck, Peter Rivera Horlbeck, that I used to put everything on. Now I've got Peter Rivera Music, and I put everything related to the music on there. As far as albums, that is my website, PeterRivera.com. One or two hours. One or two, doesn't matter. Other than that, I don't know what else to tell you, you know, and the podcast, you can just go out there and say, Peter Rivera podcasts, they're everywhere. They're everywhere. And I release them three at a time. I'm due real soon to put out three more. My son helps me with this because I'm not a tech head and he is. So he helps me do all this stuff. And, and uh, he's done in Atlanta and, uh, Anyways, I've got to call him and say, hey, Casey, let's do the next three, you know. So, you know, that's how that's how I am. I think it's been great, especially during, you know, these pandemic times that you've been, you know, keeping a line of communication with your followers and friends and everything so much through Facebook. You post pretty often and you share, you know, what's coming and things like that. So, you know, do you feel good about that engagement? I do. Uh, it uh, it uh, it entertains me. I put some things on my story sometimes, just silly stuff or whatever, you know. But I put it on there, and then on Facebook again, I put the music thing, and and uh, so I play my electric drums here and sing the song that I'm doing. And I study it for a while to make sure that I've learned all the oohs and ahs and hey, babies, because you don't want to hear, hey, baby, and nothing changed in my face. So you want to hear, hey, baby, you know, even. So I'm trying to do that. And I've and I just, I have this nice room now that I, it's kind of my studio. I got my drums and everything. And uh, I just like to come up here. And I'll just sit around and, excuse me. And all of a sudden, you're pulling a Stevie Wonder with I the was young. pulling a Stevie. <laughs> hey. Love that guy. Anyways, uh, I come up here and, and uh, I'll look at I'll look at something, I'll go, oh yeah, you know, and I'll 
next thing I know, it's two hours later and I'm doing something. So I just kind of uh, entertain myself. And, uh, you know, a lot of the people I know work. And I don't, I, I mean, fortunately, I, I just, I'm existing and I'm, I'm comfortable. I'm not a rich man, but I'm rich in so many ways, but not necessarily money and things. That's it's not a big deal. But I'm comfortable. Everything's okay. I've got really no complaints. Uh, concerns about some things, of course, you know. We're all getting older and uh, got to stay a couple steps ahead of the Reaper, man. Yeah. Well, glad that you are and have been and are keeping doing what you're doing. And well, thank, thank you. you so much for all the great music through the years. On behalf of everybody watching, listening, you've given us much joy and uh, you continue to do so. So thank you. I hope that I'm here as long as you want me to be. <laughs> Thank you very much, Scott. It was fun. And uh, I go into these things and sometimes I think, oh, okay, what's this going to be about? But really, I truly enjoyed this. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Truth and Rhythm. A big thank you goes out to our guest as well as to you, the viewer and listener. Also, much gratitude to Pleasure for supplying the show's funky opening and closing music. As a reminder, you can always access the complete list of link shows by episode at funkinstuff.net. I urge you to support this program and receive the extra benefits along with that by subscribing to the Funk and Stuff channel on YouTube and sharing it with funk, R&B, and jazz lovers, joining Truth and Rhythm's membership program at Patreon, submitting a donation at funkinstuff.net, buying Everything is on the One, the first guide to funk book at Amazon, Shopping at the Funky Things store for cool merchandise at funkinstuff.net and linking through funkinstuff.net for all of your Amazon purchases. In addition, if you're an artist or anyone seeking proven results oriented professional marketing, PR, writing, or editing consultation or production, check out the media services section at funkinstuff.net. Also, I encourage you to drop me a line at scottg at funkinstuff.net. I love the feedback, suggestions, guest requests, appearance and sponsorship inquiries, and just talking about my favorite subject, groove-based music. For now, and as always, this is Scott Dr. GX Goldfine saying, keep on keep vibing, on vibing to the rhythm of the one.